attacks that are happening. You open up a newspaper every day and you see a company getting breached, right? Um, so today we've got Bobby Guhasakar, who is our senior director for security at, here at Cisco. Hi, Bobby. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Thanks. Um, so could you tell me more about um, you know, the, how Cisco could help our customers in finding the threats and responding to them, right? So sure. obviously we do a lot of things in prevention, but uh, you know, uh, as we see in the market, it's not like prevention doesn't work, right? Yeah. Nothing is 100%, you still very much need it, yeah. but what happens next, right? And I think that's detection and response. What do we do there? What are the exciting things there? Sure, I think if you take a step back, first of all, if you look at threats in general, 99% of the threats that people need to block are actually known already, right? So very few of the threats are actually unknown, right? But people don't even get around to blocking the known stuff, right? And then even when it is blocked, there's an alert that comes up and then most of the alerts aren't even investigated, right? So there's a, there's a set of problems that kind of compound each other. And if you're a security analyst, if you work at the SOC, uh, the, the problem is really that there's too much information, there's too much data coming at you from too many systems. What do you prioritize, what do you work on, right? So Cisco, as you may or may not know, uh, over the last five years we've invested over seven billion dollars in security startups and security companies. So we've built this large portfolio going across you know, different parts of the network, the endpoint, different types of cloud gateways and so on. Now the challenge is, is that you know, how do we take all the alerts that come from these systems and actually make sense out of it. So when we give it to a human being to work on, it's actually the most important alert. It's something that should go to a human being, right? And so, right, we, yeah. And this is, this is it's a brand new product we've been working on. It's called Cisco Threat Response. And what Cisco Threat Response is, it's an application. It's an right. application to help human beings do investigations and remediation. So we take alerts that come in from endpoints. We take alerts that could potentially come in from firewalls, and then we put it together, and then we bubble up and show you what's important. And then we also have remediation that's built in, because there's, all of our products have APIs. Right, yes. So this product leverages those APIs in order to, for example, block a domain in Umbrella, or for example, to block a piece of malware in the endpoint product, right? So, right. So, um, it does sound like kind of um, intelligent sim. W would you would you comment on that? Sure. So so a, a sim is a application that takes all logs, all right. alerts yes. from the entire infrastructure. Right. So we're not doing that because a sim is really about data management. So taking you know terabytes and terabytes of information and then potentially with a lot of noise, a lot of noise, and then getting something out of that. Here what we're trying to do is to go one step beyond that. We're trying to say, okay, so in the Cisco infrastructure, what are the alerts that are coming in, and then try to correlate the important ones, and then just give you the ones that you need to work on. So what this will do for a SIM is we can actually give that to a SIM as well. Right, So that we actually provide, Yeah, we, so we, we provide the SIM with a far fewer number of things so the SIM actually becomes much more intelligent as well. So if a customer's got a SIM, great. If the customer doesn't have a SIM, this is great as well. So with APIs, we can then potentially feed data into and feed data out of it as well. Exactly, exactly. Everything Sounds is API, great. Everything's API based. It's modern software, right? And, yeah. and it also then would be correlating you know, the events with external intelligence, I suppose. That's a great, that's a great point. So threat intelligence, which is, is what is threat intelligence? It's basically, it's a list of IP addresses, it's a list of malware, it's a list of domains, and it's a list of those that are bad, right? So obviously we have amazing threat intelligence in the company, Talos is the name of our organization that uh, does a lot of the research, collects the threat intelligence, we push it to all of our products, right? In Cisco Threat Response, we can leverage that threat intelligence, we can also bring in a lot of third party threat intelligence. So things like VirusTotal, or, right, virus total. Wow, interesting. And uh, or you can get um, uh, um, feeds, threat feeds that are uh, standard-based threat feeds. You can bring that in as well, and it'll automatically correlate 
and give you basic, it takes you further down in the investigation because it looks at other sources of data before it says, hey, this is, this is important to work on. Right, sounds extremely interesting. I think Cisco Threat Response would definitely help a lot of my customers, um, you know, be us kind of struggling with this information overload and this idea of getting the right data at the right time just right at your fingertips sounds and amazing. The best part about it, it's free. Wow, free, <laughs> no way, <laughs> are you kidding me? <laughs> which, is, which isn't common for Cisco, but I mean, uh, we have made this product completely free of charge, so any customer that has Cisco endpoints, Cisco umbrella, Cisco network, Cisco network security can take advantage of this right away. So it's available today, you can download it, you can enable it, you can use it right away. Amazing, amazing, that really does sound great. And maybe any comments you'd give on you know, machine learning and security, because you know, I think, as you mentioned, there's so much data, so is it something that Cisco Threat Response would also use, or maybe the products behind it that are yeah. feeding this events? Yeah, so machine learning is used across the Cisco portfolio, right? So wherever we have a lot of data coming in, like let's say, for example, StealthWatch, Right. Stealthwatch is our product that takes in network data and then looks for behavior and then anomalies in that behavior. So Stealthwatch uses a lot of machine learning. Um, within our endpoint, our endpoint is looking at variability in samples or variability in files and then seeing which of those files are malicious or not, right? Again, uses, uses uh, automated learning to do that. Um, we use learning in our malware sandbox where you know, there's millions and millions of new files that come out every day. Human beings can't actually go through all of those and determine if it's good or bad, right? right? So we, we use it there as well. We use machine learning in Umbrella. So Umbrella is looking at literally hundreds of billions of DNS requests every day. How do we correlate the ones that are known bad or likely bad in, in, in uh, looking at a particular domain? So, Machine learning is used throughout the portfolio, um, and it's really a tool. You know, machine yeah. learning doesn't mean that the product is better. Yeah. It's really a tool, and it's a tool that you use when you have lots and lots of data to go through. Sounds great. Well, Bobby, thank you so much for being with us here in Cisco TV Studio. We really appreciate it. I My think, pleasure. You know, it, it's been great input from you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we've got Rob at the World of Solutions. Rob, Absolutely. over to you. Hey, hey, thank you so much. Yeah, we are here in the security booth talking, that's right, security. And uh, who better, if I introduce my good friend now, we just met each other, but Ben Greenbaum, uh, you are walking everybody through. I had a little bit of trouble getting in here because customers keep coming up and wanting to interrupt us and, and understand more about what you're doing, and I love how we're fleshing stuff to the surface. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what we're doing with threat response these days. Sure, you showed up just in time. I was just about to start doing an investigation into some information that we have about Drydex. I'm going to look here at the Talos blog, and I'm going to go all the way down to the IOC section, and I'm going to grab all of the indicators of compromise from the bottom of this blog article and just select them. Just select them, right click on them, and using the Cisco Threat Response plugin for Google Chrome that we just released, I'm going to extract all of the observables out of this piece of information. I'm then going to pivot directly into Cisco Threat Response with these observables loaded as the subject of the investigation that I'm doing. Now you can see right now, it is doing research on those observables. It is finding out what we know about them from all of the different modules that I have configured here in Cisco Threat Response. I've got my umbrella accounts, I've got Threat Grid, I've got AMP for AMP, Points, and we can see that from this information, I have local targets. There are machines in my environment that for whatever reason have talked to these IPs that I'm looking for, these files that I'm looking for. I can immediately take some kind of response actions on some of this uh, information as well. This you can see is already known to be malicious by our infrastructure, but if it wasn't, I could easily click here, pivot into AMP for endpoints, and add it to a block list, as simple as that, with just a couple of clicks. And that's really the power and the strength of the Cisco Threat Response platform. It's an integration platform that brings in intelligence and response capabilities from all of your Cisco investments across your entire network. This is the Cisco integrated security architecture at work through the Cisco Threat Response platform. 
All right, so I'm just guessing, Ben, that you've been down this path before. You're an extremely good speaker, and I love how you got it. Just to confirm, okay, so obviously you're making a lot of things more visible. You're talking about real-time awareness of things that are happening and then being able to act upon that. Now, you first started that off by grabbing some key indicators from a website. Now, what was the deal with that website? I didn't catch how we were starting that. That, web that website was the Talos blog, an excellent source of uh, threat intelligence and just information about all kinds of security threats that our advanced Talos research team just discovers and analyzes on a regular basis. But the website could have been anything at all. It could have been any source of threat intelligence. It could have been an FSISAC release. It could have been a government release. It could have been information that you found in the web-based dashboard of any security products or any other kind of provider of security threat intelligence. You can pivot using the, uh, the threat response uh, website plugin for Chrome or web browser plugin for Chrome. You can pivot directly into threat response with information from anything that can be rendered in your browser. I love that. Ben, that is so awesome because not only are we coordinating information from multiple sources beyond ourselves, because I think, it, not to miss the story, that actually Talos is a key source of a lot of that uh, real-time information from around the world. We're going to have to run now, but thank you very much. I appreciate this. Great information, guys. Get a chance to come over to the security booth. If you can catch Ben, even better, but there's a lot of smart people here regardless, but make sure you understand how this stuff works. Thank you, Rob. I really love that Cisco threat response demo. I think what it really shows is that visibility doesn't mean that you just know about certain events. It means that you get the right events uh, offered to you at the right time, right? And that's what essentially visibility means in the Cisco threat response. Um, I have to say I'm extremely excited about this tool and uh, I'm even more excited about the show that's and we are going to the Innovation Showcase. Oh. Hello everyone and welcome to the Innovation Showcase Theater. Theater. My name's Toby and I have the pleasure of being your host today. Now we all know that to thrive in the new world of digital business, companies have to stay on top of innovation like never before. So we're bringing you 11 sessions here from the Innovation Showcase and we're going to share with you the latest solutions, service innovations, and best practices, which we know will inspire and engage you here at Cisco Live 2019. Now, today we'll be exploring the world of security, and it's my pleasure to introduce you and have up here on stage Jeff Reed. Now, Jeff Reed is Senior Vice President of Product for Cisco Security Business Group, overseeing product management, customer success, and technical marketing. Previously, Reed was SVP of Cisco's Enterprise Infrastructure and Solutions Group, so he comes with expertise in both networking and security. He's a regularly featured speaker here at Cisco Live Europe's Innovation Showcase. Please give a warm welcome to our stage, Jeff Reed. Thanks, Toby. All right, welcome everybody. So, we're going to talk about a subject near and dear to my heart, hopefully near and dear to some of your hearts as well, around the firewall and what's going on in the world of network security. Why is this interesting and important? Because as you all know, the way that users and things are getting to applications and data is changing. Cloud, IoT, mobility, all these things are kind of fundamentally changing the traffic pattern and where you want to deploy security controls in your environment. And so as that happens, we have these questions like, is the perimeter dead? Where do we put those controls? As you might expect, this is an area that we at Cisco have been paying a lot of attention to. And what I want to do is, is first kind of walk through the broader vision of this transition. It's kind of really being driven in all of your environments. But then I'm going to double click specifically around the network security component and the firewall pieces and kind of what we're doing in that space. I'm going to be joined by three different demos, so hopefully you get a lot of actual like, visibility into the specific technologies that we're building in this area. So let me start first with a diagram that is a lot of you are network people out there. It's not a real network architecture, but it helps me tell the story in terms of what we're doing. So look, in the good old days, things were pretty simple. Your applications and data were basically within your corporate perimeter. You didn't have that much traffic going out to the internet. At a few places where I was egressing, I'd put my DMZs, I'd put my security controls. Life was simple. Little thing called the cloud comes along, mobility starts to happen, and all of a sudden things start getting really complicated. 
And so what we've done at Cisco, we're making kind of, we've made four kind of big investments in this area, kind of as we start to see this transition happen. The first one started with our acquisition of OpenDNS and our umbrella technology. I like to call umbrella like the best pound for pound fighter in security. Like nothing is as easy to deploy or as effective as Umbrella. So that's the really kind of compelling piece. And, and Umbrella is really about protecting user to service traffic. Like that's where it sits, how to protect things and users going out to the internet. So that was step one. One other thing to keep in mind, Umbrella brings with it a very like worldwide infrastructure around cloud security kind of points of presence and in, in infrastructure. And that'll be important as I, as I go along further. So that was step one. And that's about user to service. So the next thing that we're worried about is as applications and data go to the cloud, how do we protect those? Like they're no longer in our data center, the same controls may not be the same things we're using now. And so this is where you get our investment areas in CASB for cloud lock. And, what we're, and that's really focused at your SaaS environments. And then in your IaaS and your PaaS world, really how do we protect that service to service traffic? So StealthWatch Cloud is looking for the behavior in your cloud environments, finding anomalies, indicators of compromise. Tetration, which I'm actually really excited about. That's you know, allowing us to understand what the application dependency mapping is, like what services are talking to what normally, and then actually be able to deploy you know, fine-grained segmentation around ensuring that micro-segmentation so the only services that should talk to services can do so. And then clearly, a broad capability set around virtual firewalls. So you know, allowing you to take those technologies, I'll get to this in more detail in a bit, and bring those to the cloud. Step three, there's this little thing called SD-WAN coming. How many of you are in the process of deploying or thinking about deploying SD-WAN this year? All right, yeah, y'all, lots more. I mean, the stats that we're seeing is like between 40 and 50% of customers are gonna make a decision on SD-WAN in 2019, the thing that SD-WAN does that you guys are all familiar with is all of a sudden we have these branches where we might be enabling direct internet access or direct cloud access. So the kind of the old, the nice paradigm where I backhauled all my data, I had very few points headed out to the internet where I deployed my security controls, that's good, that changes dramatically in an SD-WAN environment. So the key here is how do we enable you in this world to put controls where your new traffic patterns happen. So this would be the core to kind of what I talk about in the second half of this, of this talk is really what's going on in this space. So that's kind of the third piece. Lastly, but not least in any way, as you think about this cloud transition, and you know, I met with, uh, we had a round table for security customers yesterday. Essentially every single customer I talked to wanted to talk about security in the cloud. One of the most effective capabilities that you want to start thinking about also is around identity. This is why we bought Duo Security a few months ago, because it turns out that 80% of breaches have compromised credentials. One of the most simple and easy ways to stop that is with multi-factor authentication. Duo Security, we think, built the single best way to do that. So they've created this real great capability around identity. They do not only user identification, making sure I trust that you are who you say you are, but they also do posture assessment of the device and create policies around what happens. And so you know, as you start looking at really access control anywhere across your environment, we think identity is going to play an absolutely critical factor. And, and that's really what you know, Duo brings to Cisco. They also bring capabilities and kind of zero trust, beyond corp, software defined perimeter, kind of these buzzwords you're hearing in the security market, where you can even get to a point where I can allow access from a user on a mobile device to a SaaS application completely off network. Because if I trust that you are who you say you are, I trust the device that you're getting access to, and I've got like, you know, Casby or something in the cloud, all of a sudden I can start doing really interesting access patterns. And so again, all these are ways that are like where security is changing as we're seeing this transition to the cloud. Makes sense. All right, head nods. So let me now double click those specifically in the network security area. As I go here, so uh, anyone know the leading networking vendor in the world? Anyone? Cisco? Leading enterprise security vendor? 
people might not know that, all says Cisco. And I think this is really important, because you know, as we look at network security, we have some great capabilities by bringing what we're doing on the networking side together with what we're doing on the security side. And so you'll see, as, as, and this is part of the whole process, you heard it this morning when, when David talked, to, when we talked about what we're doing, Gordon actually talked about, right, what we're doing in terms of Viptela and integration of the firewall capability sets. This is really, really important. And that's why you know, I actually spent seven years, my first seven years at Cisco I spent on the networking side, coming over to, to the security side the last couple. So it's really about how do we drive the capabilities we can bring that's kind of unique in this, in this space. So when I think about the future of the firewall, kind of future of network security, there are three things that we're absolutely focused on doing. The first one is we want to enable world-class security controls. And what I mentioned, this is security. If you think about like, where we've been in the networking security space, lots of you are familiar with ASA, kind of where we've, we've been. You know, we acquired SourceFire because of the security functionality it brings with it. And, and the core to this is we're enabling those world-class security controls and then taking those, and the second piece is we're allowing you to deploy them in every place that you need them. So if we go back to kind of this, this vision, traffic patterns are changing, you might, know, might need to put those controls in different places. So the second piece is we're going to take those and enable you to have freedom and flexibility based on the environment that you have, the traffic patterns you have to put them where you need them. That sounds great, but there's a little concern there is it could be really complex. Like I have all these security controls, they're running in new places, so the last pillar of our network security strategy is enabling one place, unified capability around policy. So kind of wherever they run, I have one place to go for defining the, my security policy, and then one place to go to get my threat visibility. So those are the, if you kind of tie down all the things we're doing in the future of the firewall, it really boils down to these three pillars. So now what I do is I want to walk through these and give you kind of a, a sense for where we're headed. So it starts with world-class security controls. At the heart of that, you know, what we've been doing in the firewall space is taking IPS, IDS technology and integrating that into our classic firewall functionality. That's using Snort IPS. We've been the magic quadrant leader for basically as long as there's been a magic quadrant for IPS. We continue to be in that, you know, focused on enabling world-class IPS, IDS, merging that into firewall. We also have other security controls that are embedded in our network security capability. Advanced malware protection. The great thing about AMP is it, not, it came from IPS, but we've taken that control and we put it in email security, web security, endpoint security. It's going into cloud security. It runs in Meraki MX. And AMP is all about visibility. The more places where you're looking at files, any place you see a file, everywhere AMP is running and every customer benefits from that. So it's this huge, great network effect. The more places AMP is running, the better your security is. We brought it there, extending it. And the last piece is all this is backed by our Talos Threat Intelligence team. Look, Talos, they're super smart guys and gals, maybe a little unique if you meet them, but the really important thing about Talos is they have unmatched set of data upon which they can do their analytics. You see the numbers up here. And really, this whole game around threat intelligence is a data game. The more data you have, the better the visibility you're going to get, the better the controls you're going to be able to write. That's, and then more people will deploy it, you'll get more data. So it's this nice virtuous cycle that we've seen in the environment. So Talos is supporting all of our security products, taking that intelligence and driving it in. And you see this in how our customers are deploying. So we've got a great example. I don't know if we have anybody from the Lower Austrian Firefighters Association here. But you know, they deployed our, you know, our dedicated network security products and firepower. And you see the outcomes. What they found, the kind of the step up from their previous network security architecture was really around the threat response they got. So you know, finding malware they was already in their environment, blocking zero days. So these are the capabilities that if you deploy world-class security controls, you can get across your environment. So that's kind of pillar one. How do we enable that? The second piece, we've got to take those controls and we've got to make sure they're running where you need them. And this really gets back to this picture. So if you remember, we used to be able to take all our traffic, go into the DMZ, 
that's changing as more and more traffic goes out from your branch environments in SD-WAN, how do we make sure we're protecting you? The way that we're doing it security is taking those world-class security controls and making them run all over the place. So we've got the classic firepower, dedicated security appliances, a great choice for a lot of your environments. You're still going to want those in your DMZ, et cetera. But really the interesting thing here is we've taken those same controls and we're integrating them into the routing infrastructure, Merak EMX or ISR base, as well as into the cloud with our secure internet gateway with, with uh, Umbrella. So let me talk about those two things quickly. So Umbrella, as I mentioned, started with DNS protection. But we took that cloud platform and we're integrating all these additional security controls into it. So not just DNS, but full plot, proxy, secure web gateway, cloud-based firewall, integrating CASB technology, et cetera. But instead of me talking more about what we're doing in Umbrella, let's actually show you what we're doing. So Nitin Kumar, can you join me? Nitin's part of our Umbrella team is going to walk through a demo of some limited availability sneak peek stuff on the Umbrella side. Hey, Nitin. How are things? Good, good. So these are all live demos, which is potentially concerning, but I've got great faith in Nitin here. So how are we doing? It's, good. it's looking all right so far. All right, perfect. So uh, I'm glad you, you sort of queued up uh, you know, the discussion about SD-WAN and branch. Yep. So one of the main challenges that customers come to us for is, hey, we're adopting cloud applications. We're sending all of our traffic directly out to the internet. Yep. And you know, the ch there's some challenges around that. One of the challenges is scalability. So some customers, it doesn't make sense to always transport uh, their, uh, their enterprise infrastructure, right? Through all those branch locations, locations. Yeah. branch locations. Exactly. It can get expensive, and in some cases, it doesn't always make sense to have a lot of hardware at every single branch location. Absolutely. Right? Yep. And going to our topic, we're talking about firewall today. So one of the capabilities that we're developing uh, with Umbrella Platform is a cloud-delivered firewall. Fantastic. So now we're able to actually present you know, some of those capabilities in the cloud, and we'll actually run you through uh, what this looks like today. Uh, this is a, a limited availability feature. You guys are lucky enough that you get a sort of a sneak preview today. <laughs> Your innovation showcase, yeah. here we're going to talk about some innovation. Exactly. So the first thing that we would do here is the customer has to get the traffic to us. Yep, step one. So step one is get the traffic to us, and what will support day one is an IPsec tunnel. And to set that up, we would simply on the umbrella side, we would give it a tunnel name. We can call this uh, Barcelona. Pandering to the audience, yeah. I like it. <laughs> and you can see in the drop down, we have a few device types that will support from a, like attack and support perspective. Yep. Uh, ASA will Thank support you. Cisco ISR, and then we'll support CSR as well, uh, since yep. they sort of run the same code. Yep, and you work on Meraki as well. And we'll have, uh, as we move forward this year, we'll have Meraki uh, yep. MX integration, and we'll do some integrations with, with uh, Viptela. Yep. We saw the SD-WAN story, so that's sort of how we stitched these uh, products Perfect. together. Networking plus security? Exactly. All right. And the last thing you see is there's another uh, sort of uh, option here. So that means even if you don't have an edge device that is uh, non-Cisco, we can still uh, create the IPsec tunnel on there and then go ahead and, uh, and route the traffic to us. Not that we recommend that, but yeah. <laughs> exactly. So what I would do is simply click Save, and then th this would generate a cert, and then part of our IPsec tunnel configuration would just be dropping the cert onto the uh, uh, the, the edge device, whatever you, you want to use. Yep. So once we have our tunnel set up and once it's talking to our, our data centers, the next part is what do we actually do with that traffic? So with Cloud Delivered Firewall, what we can do is set up a, a basic firewall policy. So we have, uh, we have one pre-created, but I'll actually give you guys a preview of what it's actually going to look like. So initially, it's going to be an L3, L4 firewall. Yep. And then we'll be introducing layer seven uh, capabilities later on this year. Perfect. So we can basically cover you know, any protocol, uh, so your basic protocols. We can specify based on tunnel. Yep. So if you have 20 branch locations, each one has a separate network tunnel. Create different policies for each tunnel. Exactly. Awesome. Uh, we can filter by or, or block by source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port, yep. sort of the gamut yeah. of what Typical we ports and protocol, yeah. Exactly. Uh, the other function we've added in is uh, sort of a rule expiry. So let's say maybe it's, it's World Cup time, <laughs> and you want to restrict certain IPs for, to save bandwidth. So we can schedule a rule during that time to say, hey, we want to block these IPs, and you can expire at the end of World Cup, as an example. And the last part is rule action. So what do we actually do with that traffic? 
So today we can block and allow, and then we can enable logging on this as well. Perfect. Yep. So speaking of logging. Sure. Yeah, so uh, the other component that's already embedded inside of Umbrella is we can, you know, using an S3 bucket, we can export to uh, any SIM that you guys would have. So yeah, Key Radar, sure. Splunk, and we'll be incorporating the same capabilities into uh, our firewall logs as well. So if you're familiar with the Umbrella uh, logging solution today, then it's going to be Off the, and running. the same, uh, same functionality. Very cool. Yep. So I'll show you what the actual reporting looks like from a, uh, from a firewall perspective. So we go to Activity Search. And then we'll just drop down the last 30 days here. So we've already created a tunnel. Yep. Uh, we just called it NYC branch. So let me just pull that up. It's your demo environment. It's our demo environment that we set up a tunnel on. So we can automatically filter by just the tunnels. And we can do this across multiple tunnels. The other component that we've added on is being able to filter specifically by firewall logs. So yeah, we can actually cool. do that. And so this way, we see all of the traffic that's coming through through our cloud-delivered firewall. Obviously, it's all your case, firewall yeah. events. Yeah, 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 all the firewall events for any location that you set up with uh, with uh, Umbrella. Very cool. Uh, the other thing we can do is just drill down. So if we wanted to know more information about a specific request, we can uh, just click on this little guy here, and now we get full details. We can filter by the IP, the destination IP, source IP, the port, the protocol. Uh, cool. So really, if you want, really want to dig into that specific request, you have all the options available to you. Nice. So we talked about SIG being, you know, f Cloud Firewall was one of the capability sets. There's other things you guys are working on. Can you share anything else you think is of interest to these folks more yeah. broadly on SIG? Yeah. Yeah, so we're also, you know, looking at, um, uh, we're also introducing CASB capabilities. And then, as Jeff mentioned, you know, proxy capabilities as well, sort of uh, getting embedded into the product. Nice. Yep. You want to show the CASB off? Yeah, absolutely. So the other the use case around branch is we talked about scalability. It's also visibility as well. So if I'm adopting all these different cloud applications, how do I get visibility into the usage, right? Yep. How do I know what cloud applications my users are using? And that's what our app discovery dashboard actually so shows is over a period of time, what applications are being adopted. Very cool. So we can drill down and we can see, hey, if, if I want to know about a specific uh, high risk category of applications, mm -hmm. I can actually drill down. And now that I see that there's some collaboration apps and there's some cloud storage apps that are actually uh, high risk. So we can actually drill down into that and give you more details. And now I have one app that was discovered under cloud storage that's high risk. Yeah. And we calculate risk based on a number of different things. All the capabilities you have in cloud lock. Exactly. And so is it, uh, does it support two-factor authentication? Yep. Does it have weak password support? So all of these factors, including compliance, make up how we actually calculate the risk. Very cool. And within the same dashboard, uh, we can say, look, we don't want to sanction this app. We actually mm -hmm. want to block it immediately so our users can't access it. It's a high-risk app. So what we do is we, from the uh, app discovery dashboard, we click on the uh, block this app. And now we go through our workflow of applying it to an existing policy. Nice. At the same time, we can actually mark this not approved. And just go from And we, we do this workflow for every app that we want to, uh, that we want to essentially block. On the other side of it, there's a setting called application settings where we can do this in bulk as well to make it easier. Very cool. So this is available today, actually, in Umbrella exactly. already, right? So App Discovery is available today All in our Umbrella insights users. and platform package. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're on the professional package, it's just an add-on, and you guys can start using it today. Awesome. So hopefully you get a sense for how powerful we're building out from our cloud security platform Umbrella. Nitin, thank you so no much. Problem. Everybody, big hand for Nitin. Thanks. Very cool stuff. Thanks, man. All right. So. That was one example in terms of where we're putting new security controls. Hopefully you got a feel for what we're doing on the cloud side. The other big one is on the, what we're doing in terms of the routing platforms. You know, we've already had integration in Meraki MX, it's running AMP, capability set, et cetera. The big announcement in the last few, few months has been the integration with ISR. So basically taking enterprise firewall, snored IPS, URL filtering driven by Talos, all that capability set running in the ISR, managed by vManage, so the same application, same you know, management console you're used to from a SD-WAN perspective. And so the idea here is like, give you choices. Like, depending on your environment, as you're making this transition, you have the opportunity to use a dedicated you know, firewall, firepower appliance, 
You can use the cloud as a place where you're going to be able to do those security components. You could do it in the device itself, or you can mix and match, kind of depending on what controls you want to run where you want them. So, like, no, this is kind of the really thing that, you know, if you going by Cisco and what we're driving in network security, this is really a strategy that we're, we're embarking upon. So, that was the second pillar. So, last pillar, as you said, Lots of places we can put controls, world-class controls, but how do we make it easy for you to manage those controls? So we're there, we're really focused in two areas. One is how do we unify policy? And the second is how do we unify threat visibility? So let's start on the policy side. So this idea is really driven by a product we call Cisco Defense Orchestrator. Started as kind of like ASA firewall rule management. But as you'll see shortly, we're extending that broadly across the portfolio. And so what, what CDO does is it really all about this idea of enabling you to, to look at, again, those common elements, those world-class security controls, and set up policy for those wherever they're running within your environment. And so to talk more about CDO and show us what we're doing there, I'd like to introduce Joel Furman, who leads our firewall product management team. Hey, Joel. Thanks for having me. All right, glad to have you there. Woo! So you're going to be showing us CDO, correct? Absolutely. All right, you're off and running. All righty. All right, so with CDO, we have the capability to effectively do centralized management. That's not just within Cisco products, and that's something that we're going to share today. So how many folks in the audience use AWS at all in your environments? At I your mean, AWS all? folks, we have it. AWS. Oh, that's it? Only a quarter? All right. All right. I'm guessing so, it's higher, but we'll see. All right, all right, keep going. So what this allows you to do is effectively today, as it exists, it allows you to manage policies in ASA, as Jeff said earlier. And what we're launching in March is the ability to manage FTD appliances as well. So you can see here in this demo pod I've got, I've got ASA and FTD devices. Now what's really neat is we're adding quite a bit more functionality to this. And if I were to, for example, click on VPN, I can see all the VPN tunnels going on in my environment. I can look at a global view of that and get kind of a WYSIWYG editor where I can uh, move things around and see where traffic is going, et cetera. I've got a Frankfurt ASA set up. I've got a Barcelona ASA set up, and I've got some tunnels. Now, one of these tunnels is kind of a mystery tunnel, right? It's going out to this IP address. We're not exactly sure what it is. And that's very common. You'll see oftentimes that occurring. And so a lot of times you have shadow IT and, and you don't really know, you know if people in your environment are spinning up AWS instances, Azure instances, yep. et cetera. And what we're actually enabling customers to do is actually get that new visibility into CDO and create common policy across multiple environments. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to onboard uh, AWS onto this environment right now. So if I go over here in my security groups in my AWS account, You'll see I've got this set up here and I can see inbound rules, I've got nothing. Outbound rules, I've got nothing. And if you've ever, ever set up policies in uh, Amazon, you'll know it's a little bit cumbersome. So if I want to set up an outbound rule, I have to click edit rules and add rule and add each one individually. If I've got hundreds or thousands of different uh, accounts and gateways and such, it can be very, very cumbersome. Very cumbersome. Very yeah. cumbersome. So what I'm actually going to do here is I'm going to exit out of this and go back to the security groups. And then I'm going to go into Cisco Defense Orchestrator. I'm going to go into my devices and services, and I'm going to hit this little plus button to onboard. Now you see we have a bunch of different choices up here, FTDs, discovering FTDs, et cetera. Now one thing you didn't see is umbrella. Umbrella, yep. Yeah, you, you didn't see that. And then we've got <laughs> connect to AWS VPCs. So if you click on that, I'm actually going to onboard that VPC we were looking at. And you'll see how fast this is. Again, this is completely live. I'm going to choose my US East. So you're kind of creating the profile in CDO? Correct. Yep. I don't need to rename it, and I'm just going to continue. I don't need to add any custom labels. And right now, I actually have my AWS VPC environment synced seamlessly yep. with CDO. So what this allows me to do now is if I go here into VPN and I click on this little globe over here, 
Now instead of this being a mystery address, I can actually see this VPN tunnel. AWS, yep. Bingo, VPC. terminating into my New York uh, VPC. Now clearly, if I've got a, a VPN tunnel going into my private cloud, or I'm sorry, my public cloud, yeah. I'm going to want to control what assets are on that, right? And I, I don't want the wild, wild west occurring or data going out of that VPC. So I look in this VPC, and again, you can look over here and see there's no outbound rules on here. And I decide, you know what, I want to deploy my golden template that I'm using with ASAs, FTDs, and other devices on-prem. I want to deploy my gold template in the cloud. Yeah, so you've got a standard outbound policy set. Absolutely. So I can show you, we go into network policies, we scroll down to the bottom, and here, it's just a very basic outside ACL policy. Yep. So if I come back here to this main window here, I can take my gold template and just copy it and select device, my New York AWS VPC, select the default interface, choose direction out, because again, I'm worried yep. about what's going to leave that VPC environment, hit save, and as I hit save, the policies are immediately populated in AWS. So, so now- So CDO is translating that policy into the AWS environment for you. Exactly. On the native AWS firewall. Exactly. So now when I come back and look at outbound rules, all I have to do is hit refresh, and now I have all those outbound uh -huh. rules seamlessly in AWS. Now this is incredibly helpful because a lot of times customers will sync up not with CDO or, or with any other tool, they'll sync up a tool to Amazon, they'll go, oh my God, I had no idea how many resources from my prem were actually reaching out to the cloud until I started syncing up AWS accounts to it. But the key here is also being able to take this common set of policies and deploy them, ASA, Firepower, Umbrella's coming, Meraki's coming, Nutella, so all those places, you have one place to do the management policies. Absolutely, and it does quite a bit more than that. So if we jump back into CDO, and I have another environment here, if I look at some of these devices and services, you'll see ASA and FTD devices. Um, a lot of folks have, have uh, in this room, I'm sure, have played around with upgrading ASA and FTD devices, and it can be a little challenging sometimes, it's not quite seamless. We're actually going to show you how within just a couple of uh, minutes, you can actually do a very quick upgrade. So I can go in here, and actually before I do that, I want to show you one quick thing. Don't take too long. I won't. <laughs> um, if I click on configuration, a neat trick we do here is I can actually access the command line interfaces, and I can save favorite scripts that I've got. So if I want to create a VPN and it's something that I do frequently, all I do is click this one button and I can just enter in the specific elements of interest that I've defined, predefined in For a those template. those policies, yeah, yeah. Exactly, so most firewall admins do the same 15 or 20 things over and over and over. This really speeds it up and of course this will do it for FTD as well. But if I go back real quickly to the upgrade process, I can select a couple of ASA devices for example, click upgrade. I can select an image, and this image is residing uh, in the cloud on our server. You'll These see are our latest and greatest images. They're populated already. Yep. Correct. And you'll see one of them is actually red. So that's saying, hey, I'm already on the latest version. So it'll actually do a version check. It'll make sure it's got enough CPU and, and, and uh, storage space, et cetera. So I hit continue. I'm going to use a uh, image from my repository to upgrade the ASDM as well simultaneously. I'm going to, you can choose to copy the images only and then do an upgrade later. You can do copy the images and, and install and, and reboot, reboot. Yep. automatically, or you can actually schedule an upgrade for a later date and time at a particular window that you so desire. I'm actually going to push this immediately, and you can now see the status of this. So if you've done an upgrade in the, fa uh, in the past with one of our appliances, whether it's uh, FMC or with ASA, once you hit upgrade, it just kind of cross your fingers and hopefully everything works out. What's really great about this is I can actually go in and device by device see that there's an upgrade in progress. I can click on this, I can review the upgrade, I can see what it's doing. So in here, I, it's checking the connectivity state, it's copying yeah, the image, yeah. et cetera. You can roll back if you need to. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I think this is, so this is a good example of how we're, again, trying to use the power of the cloud, see as a cloud-based product, to really fundamentally improve that whole policy experience, give you a single place across the breadth of where you're doing network security to have control. Great. Awesome. Joel, thanks. thanks. This is fantastic, everybody. Big hands for Joel Furman. All right, so that gives you a sense on the policy side 
The other big thing that we want to make it easy for you is on the threat side. So again, you have all these security products, they have visibility to different threats. How do we make sure that you've got a single place where you can get visibility on them as well? That's what we've done in Cisco Threat Response. So Cisco Threat Response isn't only about network security. It actually supports our AMP for endpoints, it's in beta for email. So think of this as a single place where you can look for known you know, uh, IOCs, see where they've been in your environment, understand what they might be related to, and really kind of get, a, that, again, a single place across the breadth of where you're deploying security controls, get understanding of that, the, that, the threat visibility they have. So to talk about this, I'd like to introduce Nasif Erdos. Nasif, he's a TME on our Cisco Threat Response team. Nasif, you, welcome to have you. Thank you. So you're going to give us a little demo on CTR. We're Cisco. We create acronyms for everything. Um, before, you were actually, though, you were a practitioner on the security side, right? Yeah, yeah. and the hardest part was how long it took yep. to get questions back as to something as simple, are we affected by something? Yep. We had to go to multiple systems, endpoint, network, just all over the SOC to figure out are we affected. So I want to show you what we do these days. Yep, perfect. Um, Sneal walks into the office and he <laughs> asks, are we affected by RAISI? Yep. When these things are published, consider this to be a security intelligence bulletin. Uh, we've got our uh, Talos team. This is our Talos blog. Yep. That publishes the indicators of compromise. What we've done with Cisco Threat Response is being able to just grab this information as it is, and through our extensions, can we search this? Right now, I'm going to go through 10 observables, and immediately, you're going to know out of that thing that you selected, yep. five are malicious and five are unknown. Wow. We've just pulled on our threat intelligence. Right there. Umbrella yeah, yeah. Investigate. Talos Intelligence so and Global Intel, as well as Virus. So Google. basically, enriching all of the things in those observables with what we already know across Cisco. Within a few seconds. With seconds. All right. Now I've got to answer the next question. Like, Am I impacted? Are we impacted? Yeah. What we do here is click Investigate. Again, I just did one click, <laughs> and when I did that, I went across my portfolio and asked, "Am I affected?" Immediately, I know I am affected because I've lit up three targets. Okay, so three, the purple guys. The purple guys. Yeah. What well, the purple guys are telling me that I've got one endpoint that has reached out to something, okay. and I've got two network identities that have reached out to something. Network comes from umbrella. Okay, yeah. Endpoint comes from AMP for endpoints. Yep. And I may want to start acting on these things now. So I see this particular domain. At this point, I see that I've got some endpoints reaching out to this domain. I want to block it to give me immediate protection okay. while I perform the investigation. With the linkages into Umbrella, the enforcement API specifically, I get to block this domain. So right click, block, single place, one tool. Done. Now of, of interest in the security operations center are those things that are unknown, Jeff. And the unknown This is what your here, old job used to be mainly about, right? Spend a lot of time figuring out the unknowns. Green is green, red is malicious, <laughs> orange what's, what's or gray, gray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's where we spend a lot of time. So right now, we've known that we've got a file here that is unknown to us. Yep. We could decide to block it now, Jeff, or we could add it to our investigation. Okay. Which one would you like Find to do? Find out some more. Let's do uh, door number two. Okay. We'll add it to the investigation. And when we add this element that we had no idea about two minutes ago to our investigation, we open the aperture to the oh, wow. scope. So look what happened, Jeff. Simply by adding that hash, I'm able to tell you that that hash traversed a network gateway. Yep. It came in across our email security appliance. <laughs> and guess what? Two email addresses were targeted. OK. So I know this was probably a directed fish. Yeah. The at, file got in, one of my users clicked it. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At they this clicked stage, it, the network security device saw it. Here you go. At this stage, I can decide so to block it. I think we should it. maybe block it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so if we feel we need to block it, again, we add this to our simple custom detection list. This right click. Block. You block an AMP. If AMP's running the firewall, if it's running Block email, an AMP, block every, across everywhere. everything that is tied into that AMP cloud. That is killer. So you've got that protection at speed. Yep. But your talk was about firewalls. Yep. I want to show you what to do with firewalls. All right. This is a security intelligence event from the Firepower Management yep, Center. 
the security intelligence event, that IP, we've got a beaconing host on the network. OK, not a good That thing. is beaconing out to an IP address that we know we are blocking. OK. As security operations, we want to answer the next question. Who? What <laughs> and who exactly yeah, yeah, doing that. is doing that? Through the integration with the 6.3 code, we are able to just come in here and go to threat response. Watch what we're going to do in seconds. We're starting with an IP, and in a few seconds, you are going to derive a target. And more specifically, again, you find out that there's a brand new file, file on that unknown target. Because attackers can change their hash in a file very quickly. Second. Again, we can go down door one or door two at this time, any way you do. The Let's point here it. was yeah. <laughs> we can block it now at speed. So that's so pivoting directly from our network security products into threat response to do a block using whatever the right control is at, at that point At in the time. end of the day, we can protect the environment by getting to the root cause. That's awesome. And hey, Nasef, this is super exciting stuff. Thanks so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. So, so hopefully you get a sense like how powerful this can be of having something that works across the breadth of security controls in your environment we launched this at RSA last year. We've kind of just virally seen it get to over 3,000 customers already today. Started with AMP for endpoint, then umbrella support, email, and network and firewall are in beta right now. And we're extending that across, again, the breadth of places. So all the places you have security controls, be able to feed that visibility into threat response. And that's a good segue to the close here, which is, look, when you're thinking about network security, Yes, we've been all, all focused around what we're doing around network security, but you want to think about network security as part of your broader security architecture and environment. And that's where really the power of Cisco comes. We have an unmatched set of capabilities in the space. I talked a lot about the networking side, but we're investing in cloud, we're investing in endpoints. You know, we've spent roughly six and a half billion dollars on network security, or I'm sorry, on security acquisitions in the last five years. We've more than doubled our R&D and security specifically. Like we are absolutely focused on being the best and your most trusted security vendor in the marketplace. So hopefully this was helpful. You kind of understand like where we're going around network security. Again, three simple things world-class security controls in every place you need them with a single place for you to do policy and a single place for you to, to understand threat visibility. So with that, thank you so much. You can see all this stuff over in our security world of solutions demo area and get more visibility. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful rest of Cisco Live. Thanks, everybody. innovation showcase by Jeff Reed. I just love this story about the future of the firewall. I think it's so spot on. Can totally relate to that, uh, you know, at my customers. Well, we are back to Cisco TV studio and uh, we've got Bobby here again with us. Uh, thank you, Bobby, for, you know, staying with us here at the Cisco TV studio. My pleasure. Yes, and, uh, you know, uh, thanks for, you know, continuing this conversation on security. Well, Bobby, um, I think we did talk a lot about the you know, event correlation and so on, but let's get back to you know, what is the biggest uh, attack vector in security? Well, that's easy. It's still email. So email. It's email. It's email. Email is still the number one threat vector. Uh, if you think about it, email is the ubiquitous application across every organization. It is. Everybody uses email every day. Uh, and then, you know, the other thing is that, you know, these days, the best technique is actually to fish somebody 
into clicking on something, right? Because a lot of the vulnerabilities, a lot of the issues with the browsers over the last five years have been fixed. Think about it, Chrome is a lot better than it used to be. Internet Explorer is a lot better than it used to be. A lot of the server side vulnerabilities have been fixed, more or less, right? So these days, if you're an attacker, your best hope is to actually try to fish somebody. And that's right. what most of the campaigns are. How do you do that? You send somebody an email with a link, they click on uh, some kind of a site, and then you harvest their credentials, things like that. The other day, uh, so I received this email which said, well, your Office 365 mailbox is full, and it said something like it was 10 gig, you know, and it's full. So I was like, well, that's impossible, <laughs> right? Yeah. So it was such a clear, you know, kind of a test. So I'm sure it was like a test from Cisco team. Totally. But I think a lot of people would actually click on that link. Exactly, because most users are not technical. So most users don't know if it's real or it's fake. And then when, and the goal of most of those phishing exercises is to harvest your credentials. Take you to a false site, which looks just like the real site. Have you type in user ID and password. You can even, some of the new campaigns are even trying to spoof MFA as well. So right. it's very, very sophisticated, but, but phishing is the real big thing with email. It's still the number one vector. Okay, so what would you say are the Cisco's latest innovations in email space, right? Because we know, you know, that's the biggest threat, uh, attack vector, but, you know, email security sure. has been around for a long time as well, but is there anything new, anything exciting we are doing in email security? Yeah, actually, actually there is. So, I mean, there's a lot of interesting things happening in email security. So, first of all, if you look back, the, the big goal of email security over the last 10 plus years was spam. So how do we yes. reduce the amount of spam? And then it was malware. So people getting malware as attachments in email. So those two problems have largely been solved. Different vendors have different efficacy rates for it. So for example, lots of our customers tell us that when they go to Microsoft's native email in Office 365 and they don't put on a uh, email security gateway, that oftentimes they see that spam and malware tends to increase, right? But for the most part, most of the vendors have solved that problem. What's happening now is what is basically all types of fraud. So in, in, the, in the industry, it's called business email compromise. Right, I actually have some of the customers that tell me that, you know, recently their CFO has had a fraud, right? Where yep. you know somebody would send, let's say, an invoice and say, "Well, you got to transfer the money to that," uh, and it looks, you know, kind of legit to the financial teams. And what they do is yeah. they actually transfer big amounts of money <laughs> to attackers. Yeah, and it doesn't even. Ha so, so the the very prominent cases involve CFOs, and maybe it's like millions of dollars that get transferred over. But there's lots of cases where you know it's less than a thousand dollars, and it's and the email is sent to somebody in in purchasing or um, you know somebody in the finance right. department yeah. who's just approving it because it's not that much money, right? Right, as well. So, yeah. So the, so the big thing, one of the big areas in email is really around um, checking the the sender's domain and checking the domain reputation. So. A lot of what happens in email is you get an email, it looks like it's from your colleague or from your boss, but it actually isn't. And so yes. one new technology in, in email security is to really verify that the email that's coming from a specific domain is, is the actual domain it's supposed to be from, right? So that's, yes. that's, that's, so that's one technology. Another technology- Is that what we call yeah. DMARC? Yeah, so DMARC is yeah. the protocol. Yeah. And DMARC consists of a set of uh, a set of things in the protocol, which guarantees that only certain senders are allowed to send based on who they are. That's been allowed. It's basically kind of a whitelist model, and then right. and then the receiving party checks if this email came from that whitelist. Yes. So it's so that, that's the idea. Another really quick one I, I want to tell you about is. Um, a lot of email security is now being modeled. So for example, if you and I send each other email within the organization, the, the email security technology can now model the kinds of communications that you and I have. Right. So let's, let's say you're in HR and I'm in finance. What are the emails that you and I send to each other? What's normal? And then based on that, if there's an email that gets sent that's out of that normal, then we flag that as something that could be phishing. 
So that's another way that we're trying to stop phishing is by profiling the behavior of emails within the organization and from the organization going out. Right, I love that. It really does sound like something my customers would definitely appreciate, right? Like <coughs> looking at that behavior and understanding you know, what are the patterns. I think that, that sounds amazing. And this is, goes to your previous question, the, the last segment about machine learning. This is right. another area where we're applying machine learning techniques in order to figure out what is the norm and what is outside the norm by studying how the emails are going back and forth within the organization. So is it like a, kind of an addition to the email security offering? So like the domain protection that you, meant, you were right. explaining? That's right, so the domain protection is one. Another one, this one is called advanced phishing protection. Right. But these are all available with our email security product. Okay. So it, it, what, if you make an investment in the email security product, these are all the capabilities that it comes with. Okay, so our existing customers could actually just reach out to us and get Absolutely. that la layer of protection added. Absolutely, and, and as you can see, th this is all more advanced techniques of defense, right? Because the spam and the malware are, are uh, like I said, are solved problems for the most part. These are the emerging problems that are happening in email. Sounds great. Well, thank you, Bobby. I think that was extremely insightful. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, and now, well, to give you a better insight into what DMARC is and you know the, the, the importance of this product, oh, we got a video for that, so here it is. It all started with the at symbol. Ray Tomlinson introduced this symbol to the electronic mail process in 1971. Before it was used, sending electronic messages was a lot closer to sticking a post-it note on someone's computer. It wasn't secure, but at the time it didn't need to be. Why wouldn't you trust a message from a colleague? The at symbol changed things. Instead of leaving a message for a computer, you could leave a message for a user. More so, it made these messages feel similar to traditional paper mail, wrapping the communication in a virtual envelope addressed to an individual. But as email grew, so did spam, malicious messaging, and phishing attacks. Users couldn't be sure that the message was actually from the purported sender. Attackers could mimic a virtual envelope, masking their identity to coax credentials, credit cards, or personal information from email recipients. These attacks have become the largest threat to IT security today, costing companies millions of dollars a year, and worse, damaging the trust between a company and its customers. To combat phishing and business email compromise attacks, protocols were created to authenticate message senders. DMARC established a standard where both senders and receivers agreed on how to interpret mail coming from domains supporting DKIM and SPF. The mission was twofold. One, enable brands to publish policies on how to handle unauthenticated email. Two, enabling receivers to provide authentication reporting to brands so that they can improve and monitor their authentication infrastructure. Their common goal was to develop a formal standard backed by a large consortium. The resulting DMARC specification was published on January 30th, 2012, and has over a dozen founding companies across financial services, email, and internet providers. DMARC uses SPF and DKIM to authenticate email senders. If fraud or errors are detected, DMARC takes the extra step to tell the receiver's server to quarantine or reject the communication based on the domain owner's policy. But it doesn't stop there. DMARC relays this information back to the brand owner, ensuring they're aware of the activity and able to inform their email administrators about these suspicious activities. With the help of DMARC, the investigative work is done for you, restoring confidence in your inbox. At Cisco, we value security above everything else, providing visibility and workflow management for the masses. We believe deploying DMARC will keep your business's emails safe. To discover how, visit cisco.com slash go slash email security. And that was the video about DMARC. I think it's extremely important. My customers in the Netherlands, some of them, the government institutions, are actually now required to implement DMARC, so please do keep in mind it's extremely important. 
Well, now we are going to World of Solutions where Steve has a demo of email security for us. So Steve, over to you at World of Solutions. Thank you so much, my friend. I appreciate it. We are in the middle, not only of World of Solutions, but this is the Cisco campus, the lifeblood of Cisco Live 2019 Barcelona. We are in the security area. How can you tell you're in the security area? Guess what, just cast your eyes to the skies. You see those big red balls up above me? That means we are in security. I got Usman Dean hanging out over here with me. How are you, bud? Good to have you. Well, thank you very much, how are you? Thanks for taking some time today. Let's talk uh, email threats, email security a little bit, right? Email, uh, so vital to protecting an organization against attacks, phishing, malware, and so forth, right? Email security, it's in the news all the time. We don't want to be in the news. Being in the news is the last place in the world you want to be. So let's talk about what we're doing here at Cisco to make sure we do not stay in the news, that we can put products out there to help stop those email attacks and threats. Absolutely. So we just recently launched our new version of email security, so ESA version 12.0. And with that version, we really had two themes. One was about efficacy and one was about integration. From an SVP standpoint, what we did was we released version, uh, what we call center domain reputation. And center domain reputation really allows us to grab more information about that email, specifically the headers of an email, and look at things like your, your from address, your envelope, your reply to. Take that domain and tell me more about that. And with that, we actually give you seven different verdicts about that domain and tell you how bad it is or good it is or awful. We have seven different levels. And with that, you have a lot of rules you can create around that. The other thing that came out of that uh, feature was something called domain age. So you can look at an age of the domain and say, hey, you know what? This is only a day old, I'm not going to accept that email. So it really gives you a lot of power in terms of how you want to handle that email. From an integration standpoint, our first focus was Cisco Threat Response. So you probably heard about that, you are hearing a lot about that, so we're in there as well. So what we can do now is with Cisco Threat Response, you can actually query in to your, uh, your security management appliance, which has all your tracking information. So you take a SHA value, a URL, an IP, or domain, look inside a CTR, and then you get the information out of the SMA. So you can see who in your environment received that email with that particular IOC, or indication of compromise. Along with that, we have third party sources. So something called sticks over taxi. Now it's a lot of acronyms and stuff like that, but really what it is is the ability to have a third party feed into your ESA to be able to take some additional actions on it. So if you have a custom feed for your, in, your industry, so you have a healthcare feed or something like that, a block of things that you should be blocking, that may not be something that we would look at. Um, you can use that to actually take some actions on that email. What we've also done, and it's really big for us, is opening up APIs. So our security management appliance, which holds all your tracking and your reporting and your uh, uh, quarantine information, now have APIs that you can access to be able to use all that information in third-party tools, or if you want to be able to make automated queries, we'll be able to do that. So a lot of benefits in terms of upgrading 12.0 uh, for email security. All right, so what I want to know is how easy is it for the organization, for the customer, to be able to implement this? They, they see V12, they want to onboard this, they want to get up and moving rapidly. What is the complexity involved with getting this going for them? So there's a button called Upgrade. That's it. That's the complexity. <laughs> Seriously, it's as simple as pressing a button? As it is, if you're an existing email security customer, you can upgrade your appliances or you can go into the cloud and request an upgrade to version 12. If you're not a customer, well, uh, the POC is very easy. You can go into the cloud environment and request a 30-day trial, or if you want to run something on-prem, you can get a virtual appliances or physical appliances and run it for a, a period of time to actually try it out inside your environment. So not only is Cisco pushing the envelope forward in terms of email security, we're making it as easy as possible to put it into play. It almost just sounds like you're bragging, man. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually really easy and we have a lot of success on this. We've seen in our beta testing for this particular version, uh, center domain reputation ended up with about a 10 to 15% bump in efficacy. Wow. So imagine yourself as an organization, you're getting a million messages a day, another 15% that could be potentially caught as a threat coming into your environment. So a huge benefit for upgrading to 12.0. Fantastic. All right, if people want to know more, I know the people who are here at the show, they're going to come by here into the Cisco Showcase. They're going to be able to see it all firsthand. What about these people who are tuning into the broadcast? Where can they go to learn more about what's going on in email? So they can go to cisco.com slash go slash email, and then email security. And then they'll be able to see everything about what we offer from our portfolio uh, on that website. Fantastic. So make sure that you come on down, visit Usman, check more of it out. Thank you, my friend. So appreciate you taking the time uh, to tell us the story on this. So cool, and again, so, so, so simple, and that's what it's all about. All right, great. So what I'm going to do is we're going to head back up over to uh, I got him back in the studio. Now Bobby is still with her, but she's got a new addition to her team. Jeff Reed is up there with you directly from a phenomenal innovation showcase. We're going to listen on in. Back to you, I got him. Thank you, Steve. Indeed, we are joined by Jeff Reed here straight after his innovation showcase. Hi, Jeff, and thank you for being here. I'm glad to be here. Thanks. Well, Jeff, could you, well, again, give us this view on 
what's the future of the file? Of course, you just had to talk about it, but maybe in just a couple sentences, again, like what's the main idea of that? Sure, yeah, so really three things. Uh, so first thing is we're enabling world-class security controls, Snort IPS, advanced malware protection, et cetera. Second thing, everywhere you need it. And I think the, the interesting thing about the network security you know, kind of evolution is traffic patterns are changing. This is happening with SD-WAN, with more and more traffic applications and data being in the cloud, mobility. So your traffic patterns are changing and you need security controls wherever they're going. And then the last piece is doing both those first pieces, but with one place where you can get unified policy across everywhere there, those policies and controls are. And then second is one place where you can get threat visibility. And I think you guys talked about Cisco threat response, so that's a core yes. of it. But building on top of that with what we're doing with Cisco Defense Orchestrator as a single point for policy wherever those world-class controls are. Sounds great, and I, I think it's really, you know, kind of, Responding to my customers' needs, because what I see at my customers is like, okay, there is no perimeter anymore, right? Perimeter just does not exist, so there is no like firewall alone that you need. Exactly. It's security at every single place, whether it's an endpoint, network, cloud, your own cloud, you know, or your own data center, or public cloud, and so on. And it's that level of, you know, as you say, single policy and you know, event correlation that we can now yeah. offer to the customers. I really find that amazing. I think it really is so spot on. Yeah, and, and the great thing here is it really leverages the strength we have in networking with all the capability sets we have on security. So, you know, we've invested in such a great set of controls, but now we're integrating with Meraki, we're integrating with ISR, we're taking those controls and putting them into Umbrella. So again, like, to your point, like the, the old perimeter when everything was within your within the corporate boundary and not a lot of stuff was going out through the your DMZ, like that's no longer the case. The key here is give you that flexibility and know that hey, some customers may, may still want a dedicated appliance to do this here, or they may want to do it in the cloud, or they'll integrate it with the network, or they'll have some combination of all three. And I think only Cisco enables that. Yeah, right. I, I would just add that I think Basically, it's going to go from a hardware perimeter to some kind of a software-defined perimeter. Absolutely. Right? So, perimeters are not going to go away, right? Uh, we will yeah. always need some kind of a perimeter. If you go into something at AWS, you'll need a perimeter. If you go into a branch office, you need a perimeter. So, it's just the definition of yeah. that has to be more software-defined. Yeah, it's no longer your corporate perimeter. Exactly. It's extending. Yeah. Well, that's actually uh, ties in very well with my next question to you, Bobby, about trusted access, right? So what do we do in terms of trusted access? Yeah, and it's, ex it's that exact same discussion. <laughs> I think that, you know, um, trusted access is basically our approach to zero trust and zero trust networking, right? So zero trust networking is a very interesting idea and I think it's an idea that uh, all of us as networking professionals really have to start thinking about, right? So you think about it. Networks have been built with the single goal in mind, which is connectivity, which is to reach the end destination. And all you, all you needed was a destination IP address and you could get to the destination, right? Right. We never bothered to ask, who are you? <laughs> yes. Where are you going? What's your intention? What are you going to do once you get there, right? And not just human beings. This could be a workload. This could be an API call. This could be an a IOT device. Everything that gets onto the network has to now start from a base of zero trust. In other words, we have to query that connection and ask for a set of variables. If they match a policy, then we let them on the network. And then we continuously reassess that as that connection's going on. That's the concept of trusted right. access. Yes. And that's really how networks have to be built going forward. It has okay. to be built with trust as the primary thing that you're building for. Thank you. And Jeff, would you say trusted access strategy of ours mean that we work now very closely with networking team? Absolutely. I think I, I gathered that from your keynote. <laughs> Just so. a little bit from my, yeah. <laughs> networking plus security. And, and, that, you know, and look, even you know, my own personal experience at Cisco, I spent the first seven years on the networking side. And it was right. really around how do we, how do we kind of make segmentation and really you know, the secure access easier. 
and and now we're able to add on what we're doing with Duo, because all of a sudden I have more context, I can understand like who that user is, do I trust who you are, do I know who you are, do I trust the device that you're getting, you're wanting to access from, so we can create a set of it's more effective security controls, but still with a relatively simple policy construct based on all the kind of the work that's been done in networking with software-defined access and ACI and all those pieces. So it's a, it's a really, it's like great timing for us to kind of bring these capabilities together. Sounds great, sounds great. And uh, Bobby, um, you know, we, we get this idea, so now it sounds like, you know, for the prevention piece, there is this single policy orchestrator, right? The defense orchestrator. Then as we move to the detection and response, we earlier discussed Cisco threat response. Now there is, I guess, an, also an umbrella of external threat intelligence, uh, so that is Talos for us as Cisco Security. Could you explain us more about Talos and how powerful it is? Sure, so Talos is our threat research team. And we have the largest threat research team, actually we have the largest non-government <laughs> threat research team. Right. There are a few bigger ones in, yes. you know, in certain governments. Um, and what these people focus on is they spend their entire day looking at the volumes of data that comes into Cisco. That's data that comes from our IPS, from our email gateways, from our web gateways, our DNS gateways. They look at all of that and then there's lots of data science and learning applied on that data, first of all. Back to the machine learning Back point we had learning. earlier. A absolutely, and you know, when you have millions of samples that come in every day, you, human beings cannot go through each of those uh, individual samples. Math, it, you have to apply math to it, right? So that's one thing that Talos does. The other thing that Talos does, it, Talos actually uh, lives in the dark web, and they look at what's happening in the dark web. Who are the actors? What are their methods? What are their tools? What are they exploiting? And that human intelligence gets combined with the machine intelligence, and together, the output of that is essentially a block list, right? So we, yes. we publish a block list, blocked IP addresses, blocked domains, blocked network behavior patterns, which is a, a snort rule, um, blocked malware hashes, which goes in AMP, we push that to all of our products. So as, as long as you make an investment in Cisco security products, you get all of the collected intelligence of Talos. Yeah, it sounds like the differentiators are really the data, so the massive amounts of data we've got, right. and then the people, right? Because you mentioned, well, you know, the only organizations bigger than Talos are the governmental organizations, so it sounds like we really have a top-notch um, organization of people there, right? That's so. right. That's right. Sounds good. Yeah. Well, um, you know, Jeff, I would like to explore the machine learning and artificial intelligence topic in security because I get a lot of questions <laughs> from customers on that. So would artificial intelligence actually solve our security problem as it is? And how do you see you know, the future of cybersecurity with all the innovation and technology that's yeah. going to come up? Well, look, I think it really comes back to the point Bobby made. It's about the data. You know, like we and other vendors, and frankly, even the hackers are using ML techniques and et cetera as part of what they do. So it, it's absolutely, it's a critical tool in our environment going forward. You know, we have a team specifically focused on that, uh, based in Prague, where we have like a bunch of PhDs in AI and ML that are looking at new data sources, you know, and they did encrypted traffic analytics is a great example of what they've done. They figured if we could instrument our network infrastructure to get more information out of it and then apply this corpus of data we have around, because they're telling us we know what, what the, the malware, how it behaves in terms of traffic patterns. And right. we're basically looking at two things. We look at the initial data packet and we look at the sequence of packet lengths and timing. And from there we can actually fingerprint malware that's encrypted in encrypted traffic without having to decrypt. And so that's a great example of like the power of ML plus the power of the data that Cisco has. Because even if you could do that, but if you weren't Cisco yeah. and you didn't have access to all that traffic data, you wouldn't be able to be successful. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to train it effectively. I remember Martin Roosh, uh, you know, after joining, after the source fires acquisition, and you know, like this question of, you know, why are you at Cisco for so long, right? And, and he was like, well, there is so much data that I've got access to. Yeah, that's, and that's the key. So it's, it's a combination of using these new techniques 
but leveraging the power of Cisco and the data access that we uniquely have that I think makes the big difference here. Sounds good. Now maybe to change the topic from the data and go more to the user because you know, as we were discussing now, there is no perimeter, but to me it also feels like the user it's himself or herself have become that perimeter. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> because we tend to talk about like security on the endpoint, security on the network, security in the data Workload. center cloud and so on. Well, how about the user, right? Because I think the users are the biggest threat. Like if you ask my customers, they're like, Vulnerability. well, the, the biggest problem yeah. are the people, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. how do we tackle that, Bobby? Yeah, I think, look, I think, I think the easiest way to think about it is that security is two things. Security is trust and security is threats, right? So all this discussion around our telemetry, all the discussion around threat intelligence, that's around the threat. So right a bad IP address or, or a malicious piece of malware or whatever. But the other part of security is trust. Who is allowed access to what? And there's credentials behind that. And so as an attacker, if you steal credentials, you don't need the bad malware. You don't need anything on the threat side. You can just simply log in, right? So it, for, for every security professional, for every security team, it's a simultaneously looking at what are my trust policies and what are my threat mitigations, right? And so for trust, uh, the obvious uh, technology that everyone should invest in is multi-factor authentication, right? right. Because it, it allows you to have a much bigger degree of confidence that it, this is the right user who's accessing the right resource. And so for us, uh, you know, we made an acquisition of Duo, it's the, leading MFA technology in the marketplace. It's the easiest MFA technology to implement. The big problem with MFA, which, which is not a new technology, is that it's been hard. And everyone knows about the tokens and how difficult it is. Yes, exactly. <laughs> what Duo does is it makes it drop dead simple. So every user in the company uses it. So it's really just becomes a normal part mm. of logging in. And when it's normal and easy, you don't think of it as cumbersome and as a security measure, it's just, this is how it works. Yes, right. sounds good, thank you very much. I, I do agree that it's really simple. I have a lot of customers that are already testing out Duo, right, after our acquisition, yeah. doing proof of concepts of Duo, and they do say that it's extremely easy to get onboarded, right? And I think that the other biggest advantage is that they can even get their legacy systems, um, you know, configured as well, so that really helps them too. Uh, well, thank you Jeff, thank you Bobby, I really appreciate your time, and uh, Jeff just came in straight from his <laughs> showcase, so that was great. Uh, yes, thanks Thanks to both of you, thank I really you. appreciate that. No, my pleasure, and I love having a security person leading this off, so thank you, Audrey. Great, love it. I'm glad, I'm glad to be here. Uh, well, and now we are going to play the machine learning and AI in security video. I think it's really kind of the wrap up of our conversation right here. Here's the video. It's all the rage these days. Companies touting machine learning this or machine learning that. Vendors promising a cure-all for every IT challenge. The hype is getting pretty thick. So what exactly is machine learning? Traditionally, computers solve problems through programs or instructions given to them by a human. Machine learning just means the computer can figure out a solution without being specifically programmed. These machines have the ability to continuously learn by looking at data and finding patterns. And they do this much faster than a human could. Let's look at two key terms in machine learning, classifiers and algorithms. Classifiers are the workhorse of machine learning that categorize observations, while algorithms are the techniques that organize and orient classifiers. Often, machine learning requires training with sets of correct question and answer pairs that lets both the classifier and the algorithms do great work. Let's look at an example to see how it works. Classifiers analyze specific data patterns, not actual noses or eyes. And with enough training, they can pick your photo out of millions of options. So how do we use machine learning in security? Envision an analytics pipeline that uses many hundreds of machine learning classifiers and algorithms all working together, analyzing millions of internal and external data points and events. The pipeline identifies and separates suspected malicious activity from the normal. 
it's then organized into specific events and then combined with actionable context for security teams. And it does all this at machine speed. Pretty amazing, right? But machine learning isn't perfect. While rare, it can miss a threat or block a legitimate file. When pressed to explain decisions, it often shares only math logic, which is not helpful in a security investigation. And it requires retraining to account for real world changes. So how does Cisco use it? We never use it in isolation, but alongside other techniques to detect malware and encrypted traffic, to find insider threats, to keep people safe when browsing by predicting bad neighborhoods online, to protect data in the cloud by uncovering suspicious user behavior, and many other applications. As a leader in machine learning, Cisco is using it for more effective security. Take a deeper dive into machine learning and Cisco security products at cisco.com slash go slash stealthwatch. Welcome to Cisco Live Barcelona. We are here at the Cisco TV studio and are so